Hi, and welcome back to week six. In this lecture, we're going to cover performance improvement through two topics, employee training and employee development. Employee development is a broad term. It includes anything that helps them grow. It could include training that is related to the job. It could include planning for one's career. And it can include personal development opportunities like going to a conference. Training then falls under this larger umbrella of employee development. Training is any attempt to improve employee performance on the job. Training usually involves some type of change, a change in knowledge, skills, abilities, attitudes. Both employee development and employee training are considered high performance work practices. They have been shown to increase the profitability per employee. They've been shown to enhance employees' value to the organization and can help the organization attract people who fit the job and fit the organization, as well as keep them once they've been hired. There are a variety of different training programs that organizations might use to improve employee performance. I have a few examples here in this figure. At the top, you can see that manager and supervisor training is the most popular. Profession, industry-specific, job-specific training comes in at number two. And then the third type of training has to do with the organization's processes, procedures, policies, business practices, so specific to that organization. The best companies to work for often have exceptional training programs. They encourage learning across the organization, across departments, from top to bottom. They also embed learning into the organization's culture so that everyone understands learning and growth is part of the job and part of what the organization expects from its employees. The best programs are also tied to the organization's goals, strategy, mission, vision. The best organizations invest heavily in their training and development programs. Finally, the best organizations conduct training needs assessment as well as training evaluations in order to determine if their training programs are actually changing behavior. Are they actually teaching people things that they need to do their jobs better? In order to develop an effective training program, we first have to start with the training needs assessment. That's our first step. The second step is to identify the objectives of the training program. What are we trying to teach? And to identify the evaluation criteria we will use to evaluate the training program. What satisfaction level are we looking for? What level of performance are we looking for? How much of a change are we looking for? Third, we need to design and deliver the training program. And the fourth step is to evaluate the training program and make any necessary changes. The first step is training needs assessment. This is simply the process of assessing training needs. And we look at multiple different aspects of the work environment in order to figure out what needs to be trained, who needs to be trained, and where that training needs to occur. Training should focus not only on what people need and what the job requires, but also what the organization requires. Those tasks and qualifications need to be determined within the context of the organization's strategy. Think back to the balanced scorecard. Think back to environmental scanning gap analysis. These procedures that we talked about at the beginning of the semester help us determine training needs at the organizational level. Organizational needs assessment attempts to identify these goals, the resources available to meet these goals, as well as the context within which the organization operates. The goal with this type of analysis is to determine where training is needed and what is needed in order to conduct those training programs. We need to consider what different departments need, what supervisors versus employees 
need. And we also need to think about the technological support that might be required in order to conduct some of these training programs. This type of analysis also looks at the organization's culture, its stable qualities, as well as its climate, the more temporary context of the environment. COVID is having an impact on many organizations' climates, but not necessarily their cultures, not yet anyway. Just as we learned at the beginning of the semester, it's important for us to recognize some of the constraints, some of the limitations at the organizational level. For instance, an organization's culture might actually be a constraint, a limitation. If an organization doesn't encourage training, learning, development, growth, then any training program that we try to implement is going to have to consider that culture, that mindset. We also need to consider the task, the job in question. You know that we use job analysis in order to figure this out. We can look at job descriptions. We can look at performance standards, the documented expectations we have for individual job titles. We can try work sampling. We, the manager, or we, the personnel psychologist, can try to do the work ourselves in order to better understand what it entails. We can look at literature reviews on Google Scholar. We can ask people questions about the job. We can ask managers, employees, their direct reports, their supervisors, their colleagues. We can ask subject matter experts. And we can conduct an analysis of some of the problems that people face on the job in order to identify, again, some of the limitations, some of the things that might prevent our training from working. Finally, we can collect data from ONET or use any one of the standardized questionnaires. We then compare what is needed to do the job with the knowledge, skills, abilities that people, job incumbents, currently have. The gap between what people have today and what they need to do the job, that gap is going to form the foundation of our training program. That is going to be the area on which we focus. The third and final category of needs assessment is the person analysis. Using this process, we identify who needs training and what kind of training they need. We can look at their performance data. We can look at their application data. We might also use psychological assessments to identify employees' KSAOs. This is a stage where the MBTI, the Myers-Briggs type indicator, would be okay to use. When we rely on information from these three different types of analyses, we can better understand where our money should be spent. Without needs assessment, we could easily train people who already know what we're teaching them to do. We might miss a group of people who really need the training, and we could end up training people to do things that aren't relevant to their job. Once you get to that third stage, it's time to start thinking about designing the actual training program. On the screen, I have several examples of some of the things you'll want to make sure you do, make sure you incorporate in your training program. Make sure that your outcomes, the things you're hoping training will do, make sure those outcomes are tied to the bigger picture. Integrate adult learning principles, and we'll cover some of those principles on the next few slides. Try to give trainees more options, more choices, autonomy, flexibility in the learning process. For instance, different assignments might have different options. Option one, option two. That gives trainees more control in the topics that they focus on. Make sure that the content is consistent across modes, across departments, across programs. At the end of the lecture, we'll talk more about different training methods that you can use. Make sure you use multiple different types. I present them each on their own slide, but you can use role-playing with simulations. 
When working with employees, you also want to make sure that you encourage active participation. You want people asking questions. You want people clarifying expectations. You want people engaged in the training program. Trainers need to prepare for that, and the training program itself should encourage it. Make sure you provide plenty of opportunities for people to practice. Make sure you provide plenty of opportunities for trainees to practice during the training program and for them to get feedback on that performance during the training program. In this class, the reflection exercises serve this same purpose. It's a chance for you to practice applying the material and get feedback from me about things you did well and things you might want to consider in the future. We usually structure material from simple to complex. That's the rational, logical way of learning. It helps people build on a foundation. If you start with the complex and move to the simple, people will ask a lot more questions and probably be confused along the way. It's very important that we do as many things as possible to encourage the transfer of learning back to the job. Why train people if they're not going to use what they learned on the job. And finally, just like anything else we do, we have to make sure that our program is cost effective. Some of us could design some really awesome training programs that would help our employees improve their job performance, but that program might cost $2 million. We have to design programs within a budget within these organizational limitations. The simple goal of training is that trainees learn something. We define learning as a change in KSAO's and or behavior. In order to make this change permanent, we practice and we apply what we learned in real life. We gain experience. There are a few things that we need to consider in order to design a program that helps adults learn, that helps them actually make this change. We have to design objectives that make sense for our organization, and we've talked a little bit about that. We have to consider principles of adult learning and make sure that those principles form the foundation of our program. We have to consider the characteristics of the people who we are going to train. We have to think about are they ready for training? Are they motivated to both attend training and to actually learn and use what they've learned on the job? Most training programs incorporate a combination of different learning outcomes. We might have cognitive, skill, or effective outcomes. We'll cover those on the next slide. We also have to look at the work environment. Everything from the support that employees will have when they go back to the workplace, go back to the work site, the climate of the organization. For instance, right now, COVID is making it difficult for many of us to complete training programs that we would normally not have as much trouble completing. We also have to look at whether the organization provides opportunities for trainees to practice and gain real world experience. If we consider all of these different things and we follow many of the strategies outlined by personnel psychologists, there is a greater likelihood that transfer of training will occur and people will actually learn something that they can use on the job. Learning outcomes are the goals of a training program. And there are three broad categories of outcomes that we might include in our design. We might focus on the development of knowledge, how to conduct a job analysis, for instance. That training program would have an outcome that is labeled a cognitive outcome. We might also focus on the development of skills, of skills related to how to use a type of equipment, a type of software, how to interact with customers, how to communicate in different ways. All of these training programs would have skill-based outcomes. We can also focus on the development of attitudes and beliefs toward the organization, toward the job, toward different topics of relevance. 
training programs that focus on diversity appreciation, cultural competencies, these training programs would have effective outcomes, outcomes related to attitudes, beliefs, emotions. These outcomes then help us write the very specific learning objectives for the training program. They also help us identify the criteria we would use to evaluate whether the training program was effective or not effective. And we can use learning outcomes to hold the training department, the training manager, the training developers accountable. Their training program should result in some type of change. The only way to determine whether or not that change has occurred is to have goals set so that you can analyze the gap between what you expected and what you actually got. Psychologists have been studying adult learning for more than 100 years, and we have decades of research to help us identify some of the things we need to make sure we do when designing a training program. First and foremost, you want to make sure that you create a comfortable learning environment. So what does this include? Everything from the location, the size of the room, the setup of the room, the lighting, the heat, the air conditioning, the food, all of these things matter and should be part of the planning process. Number two, ask trainees to set their own individual personal goals for the training program. This should be done at the beginning and then trainees should take a look at that list and see if in fact they did reach those goals. Part of the reason for this is because we want to engage trainees. It also helps customize the training program. There may be certain topics that an individual wants to focus on. By identifying those topics at the beginning of the program, they can then focus on those areas. We also want trainees to feel confident in their ability to complete the training program. Usually we want to ease people into it. We don't want to overwhelm them in the very beginning. Completion rates tend to be higher when we engage our trainees in this way by having them set goals and making sure that we ease them into it, but also by organizing information from simple to complex, using examples that are familiar to them, and by requiring them to periodically recall the information that they've learned. This might include periodic testing, assignments, role playing, in some way, trainees need to step away from learning mode and actually practice, test themselves, evaluate their progress, see if they're actually understanding what it is they think they're understanding. We know from social learning theory that it's possible for people to learn from others by observing them, watching to see what they get rewarded for, what they get punished for. Training specifically can take advantage of this tendency to learn from others. Some people are not willing to volunteer to demonstrate their knowledge in front of everyone else. But those very people who don't want to volunteer can learn something from the volunteer. Maybe the volunteer gets up and makes a mistake. The people watching learn from that. So it's important to consider how people might learn from one another. You don't necessarily have to ask everyone in the class to demonstrate something right off the bat. Ask for a volunteer, allow that volunteer to demonstrate, get feedback, and show the rest of the class what that task, what that skill actually looks like. Then you can ask the rest of the training group to participate, role play, demonstrate. It sort of breaks the ice and gives introverts, gives people who are not confident in their ability, gives people who aren't sure they understand what they're supposed to understand. It gives those people um, an opportunity to learn before trying. We know from goal setting theory that feedback is crucial to training, learning, growing, changing. Without feedback, without an understanding of whether or not we're doing what we're supposed to, learning what we're supposed to, whether we're getting it, without that feedback, it's difficult for any of us to change. So you wanna make sure that your trainees are receiving feedback 
from the trainers, from the computer, from the system that you're using to deliver the feedback. And finally, reinforcement theory highlights the importance of rewards and not just monetary rewards. Encouragement, verbal encouragement, social recognition, these things are also ways for us to reinforce change, to reinforce attempts at doing things differently. Observational learning does have value, but we also know that it's important for people to practice, to have a chance to actually do the thing they're learning how to do. So active practice is important. We don't want people passively observing and then not having an opportunity to do it themselves. We can use part learning and whole learning to help people practice different types of tasks. So some tasks, we might break them down into their different components and have trainees learn the different parts before they put all of those parts together. In dance class, for instance, people learn how to do parts of the dance in sections, eight counts at a time, and then they put the dance all together. That might be helpful for some of you who are trying to do some of these TikTok dances do it in eight second blocks, and then try to put it all together. This type of learning is usually more effective with less organized tasks, less structured tasks. It helps to break down the components because it's sort of difficult to do it all in one, one session, one sitting, one component. Whole learning is when we teach someone how to do the whole behavior, the whole task, this is usually more effective when the tasks are organized, when they're structured, when it's easy to see what that task entails. It's also more effective for the more simple tasks and behaviors. If you can't break a task into its components, then you probably can use whole learning. If we're dealing with something that's extremely complex, for instance, how to design a training program, how to design a training program is something that we need to break into different steps. For instance, needs assessment, training evaluation, principles of learning. These are different components of the, the broader concept, the broader skill, and we want to learn each one of those parts before we, we put it together. We can also look at the timing of practice. Massed practice is when we practice in one session without breaks. Cramming for a test is considered massed practice. It's done the night before a test, it's done in several hours, and there's usually not enough time to take any breaks. Distributed practice is the preferred method. In most situations, this is the type of practice that we want to use. We want to distribute it over several sessions and provide plenty of breaks in between. This is good for the brain. The brain actually needs time between training sessions to help you make the connections you're trying to make. Distributed practice is better because not only does it help us learn, it helps us remember, and it enhances the likelihood that that learning is transferred to the job. It also reduces fatigue. None of us want to cram for six hours. It happens because life happens, but none of us want to sit down for six hours and cram for a test. It is much easier and much more digestible to split that studying into six one-hour sessions or three two-hour sessions. In some jobs, we want trainees to practice so much that the behavior becomes habit, that it becomes automatic. We call this overlearning, practicing beyond mastery. So just when a trainee thinks they've mastered a topic, they attend another training program, another training session, and they're provided with additional opportunities to practice. Overlearning leads to what we call automaticity. It occurs when the behavior can be done without paying much attention, without thinking much about it. In a sports organization, for instance, you would want your athletes to be able to play the sport at a very high level, at a mastery level, but you would want them to get to the point where they respond automatically without thinking much about it. This is why athletes spend so much time practicing. 
in addition to learning principles, we also need to pay attention to some of the other characteristics of the training situation. For example, we need to pay attention to something we call fidelity, the extent to which the training context matches the job context. Ideally, the two contexts match, but we know that in reality, this is often not the case. For some jobs, this match is extremely important to the effectiveness of that training program. In many situations with commercial airline pilots, they train in simulators. They train before they go up into the air. This is obviously for safety reasons, for financial reasons. It just makes sense to practice on the ground in a machine as opposed to testing out the airplane in real life in the sky. There are two types of fidelity that we want to pay attention to. Physical fidelity has to do with the extent to which the training task mirrors the real job task. Airplane simulator is a great example. The simulator itself is designed to look just like the real airplane. We also want to look at psychological fidelity, the extent to which the training task helps them develop knowledge, skills, abilities, attitudes, beliefs, all of those things are important to training of transfer. Physical fidelity is not always important to every single job. Psychological fidelity is something that everyone needs to pay attention to when designing a training program. There are characteristics about the trainees that we also need to consider. The first one being readiness the extent to which people are ready to attend training and learn something from it. If training requires, for instance, a prerequisite, that is part of training readiness. There are three different human qualities that we might consider in order to design the best program, goal orientation, intelligence, and experience level. When it comes to goal orientation, some people are more performance oriented. They care more about performing well in that training program. They're concerned about the trainer, perceiving them as someone who takes the training seriously. They're concerned with their score in the training program. Other people tend to be more oriented toward mastery, where they care more about learning than they do about the grade they receive. People with a mastery orientation are not afraid to make mistakes. They are motivated by them because they realize that they can learn something from them. When it comes to intelligence and experience level, we know that more inexperienced employees benefit from longer, more structured training programs. It's also the case that people with lower intelligence levels benefit from longer training programs. People who are highly experienced, people who are highly intelligent can do without the longer, more structured training programs. They actually do really well when training is shorter and provides more choice, more flexibility. There's less structure. They can sort of self-regulate and self-instruct. If we consider goal orientation, intelligence, and experience level, this will help us tailor the training program to our audience. We should also consider the motivation level of trainees. Some trainees are more motivated than others. Knowing just how motivated people are can also help us develop a more effective, a more persuasive training program. One of the things that people want to know is, why should I take this training? What is it going to do for me? How does this apply to my job? We need to make sure that employees understand that if they complete this training program, they will in fact be able to do their job better. These expectancies are important because if we don't meet this expectation, not only will trainees be disappointed with the training program in and of itself, but they may actually go back to work in a sadder state than when they left and came to the training. So it's really important that we try to meet that promise, that we make sure their efforts in the training program will make a difference in the workplace and then they'll be rewarded for making that difference. We should also consider trainees preferred method. 
of learning. Different people have different preferences. The research doesn't necessarily support the existence of different ways of learning. Everyone learns by hearing, seeing, doing, but people do have preferences for how they learn. Once we've conducted the needs analysis and we've looked at training characteristics, trainee characteristics, we can start to think about how we want to design the program itself. There are a variety of different training methods that we have at our disposal. We'll cover a few of these methods in this lecture, starting with on-the-job training, which is usually a favorite. This is the type of training that employees prefer and expect. On-the-job training entails doing the actual job, usually with supervision or assistance, so that employees can get feedback and make sure that they are doing the job as they are supposed to. This type of training is useful for several different situations. When work cannot be interrupted, when special equipment is required to learn the job, and when there are safety restrictions we need to pay attention to. Internships are often considered a type of on-the-job training. Apprenticeship programs are formal programs designed to teach people a very specific technical skill. For instance, plumbers, electricians, mechanics go to training in the classroom often and then apply that knowledge on the job. Job rotation is one of my favorite strategies. It has a lot of benefits, especially for the training context. With job rotation, employees move from job to job across a unit, across departments. It just depends on the job and the trainee. But in most cases, a person gets to experience multiple different aspects of, of the job. This type of training helps them develop a wide variety of skills and also make contacts with other people in the organization. Uh, its greatest benefit is probably that it helps us prepare individuals who will eventually lead those different units or those different departments. It prepares them for that job. So this type of training is especially useful for management and leadership positions. We can also use simulators and role-playing exercises to try to mimic the physical and psychological fidelity of the training program. Simulators match the work environment, but they are expensive in terms of development and administration. But those costs are often less than what it would cost to actually use the real equipment. Role-playing exercises are usually more appropriate for knowledge workers. We can role-play conversations with colleagues, conversations with direct reports, conversations with customers. With role-playing, the idea is that trainees try the behaviors, the words, the motions, that they attempt to perform the job, not in a setting that mimics the job. As you can imagine, role-playing is a much cheaper way to give employees hands-on experience. But role-playing is not as effective, of course, as a simulator or on-the-job training. We're all familiar with these three types of training methods. Classroom lecture, distance learning, and blended learning. Classroom lecture is a great way to share factual information. This is one of the reasons why many of you attend classroom lectures. You need the foundational knowledge in order to be able to do your jobs. So in college, you're gaining knowledge. The skill development component is really up to you. You develop the skills through your internships, through your labs, through involvement in student organizations, uh, working with professors in labs, working part-time at another job, all of these other experiences are ways for you to take the knowledge that you learn in the classroom and apply it in the real world. Classroom lecture is by far the most common technique. It does not require the trainees to have any experience or any practice under their belt, which is another reason why it's a preferred method. 
And again, very effective for transferring knowledge from the trainer to the trainee. Within the classroom, we can use different methods of delivery. We can use PowerPoints, video, audio, visuals. The classroom lecture is also useful when we have a large number of people that need to be trained. Within the last few decades, more and more organizations are using what we call distance learning. E-learning is one type of distance learning, but distance learning also includes off-site training where employees leave the work site and go somewhere else for training. It can include um, different types of self-regulated learning where you learn at home with workbooks, not necessarily using a computer. Distance learning is often used to reduce travel, operational, and administrative costs. Blended learning is a combination of face-to-face -face learning in a classroom, on the job, in an internship, a combination of that with distance learning, either e-learning, self-directed learning, learning at an off-site location. All of us are also familiar with computer-based training because you're using it right now. It is a type of distance learning, but it's not the only type of distance learning. It requires a computer. This type of training can reduce development and administrative costs. We can reach a large number of people with computers and the internet, more people than we've ever been able to reach before. This type of training is effective for transferring both declarative and procedural knowledge. We can use computers to teach people about a topic, and we can also use computers to teach them how to do something. It's up to them, of course, to get the practice and report back with what they did, what they experienced. They can then get feedback from the trainer. So it's entirely possible to use e-learning to develop skills. It's just a little bit more complex than it is when we are face-to-face -face or on the job. When we use this method, trainees tend to be more satisfied when the level of human interaction is high. Anytime we conduct online computer-based training, we need to try to increase the level of human interaction as much as possible so that trainees want to participate. There are two other training methods that you might find of value. Case study analysis is useful for teaching people how to improve their decision-making, problem-solving, analytical skills. Uh, case study analysis involves reading a case, watching a case, discussing with the rest of the people in the training program what is going on in the case, trying to identify the problem, the real problem, not just the symptoms of the problem, and coming up with some type of improvement plan, some type of plan that allows you to address the problems that you all identified through your analysis. We often use case analysis in groups, but it can also be used on an individual basis. Games, simulations, outdoor experiential programs, these are all some of the newer types of training programs. They've popped up within the last few decades and become more and more popular. The jury is still out in terms of just how effective these programs are. Unfortunately, the fun vacation getaways with trust falls are not typically effective. There are certain groups, certain teams that do benefit from going away, being isolated from others, training together, practicing together, and getting to know one another better. All three of these methods share one thing in common, and that is that they allow trainees to experience different parts of the job in a safe environment. Games and simulations do provide value when they are embedded within other methods. On their own, as a standalone method, they don't provide many benefits. Just like anything else we create, we need to evaluate the training programs that we develop. This process begins by establishing the criteria that we're going to use to evaluate the program. We need this criteria before we design it and before we conduct it. This process also helps us determine whether trainees met 
their personal objectives as well as the organization's objectives for the training. It can provide feedback to the people in charge, the people who develop the program. It provides feedback so they can improve the program for future trainings. And this process can also help us justify the cost of a program. It is an investment in our employees, but we have to be able to show that it actually worked. We have five different levels of things we need to pay attention to in order to evaluate training. Let's start at the bottom. The very bottom level, we're focused on reactions. Do people like the training? Are they satisfied? At the second level, we're concerned with knowledge transfer. Did people actually learn anything? At the third level, we look at behaviors. Did the trainees change their behaviors as a result of the training? And sometimes they change their behaviors, but not because of the training. The evaluation process will help us determine whether or not it was our training program that led to the performance improvement or the behavior change. At the fourth level, we're looking at the impact on the organization. Did the training program have a measurable impact on employees' performance on the job? And at the highest level return on investment, we are conducting a utility analysis to determine whether or not the money we put into the training program was worth it. Here, we split these five criteria into two categories, internal criteria and external criteria. Reaction criteria is the most common, but it's the least helpful. Asking people on a scale from very bad to excellent, how great was this training program, does not tell us very much about whether the investment of $2 million was worth it. We can also assess trainees' learning with tests post-training to see if their knowledge has changed between pre-training and post-training. There are three different types of external criteria that we want to pay attention to. The first one is behavior criteria. We are looking to see whether the information learned in training is being transferred to the job. In order to understand transfer of training, we need to consider the climate in which we expect it to happen. Some climates are more supportive of transfer than others. Imagine going to a training program and when you return, no one talks about the training program, no one asks what you learned, whether you liked it, you are not provided with any opportunity to practice. In that situation, the climate is not supportive of transfer, it's actually inhibiting it. We can look at horizontal transfer and vertical transfer. Horizontal transfer has to do with whether or not um, knowledge or skill can be transferred from job to job within the same level of the organization. Vertical transfer has to do with whether knowledge, skills, abilities learned in training can be transferred from one's job up to the next level in the organization. We usually wanna consider vertical training within succession planning career development systems because we are trying to predict the future and determine the human resources for future openings. So vertical transfer is relevant to that type of situation. Transfer of training and principles of learning are two aspects of the training system that personnel psychologists specialize in. Before training, we want to make sure that we invite supervisors and trainees and even trainers to participate in the planning and development process. The more people we involve, the better the program and the higher the likelihood that they actually participate in and support the program. We want to make sure that our objectives and our outcomes for a training program are based on the job. They're based on application during the training program. Make sure that the training context and the job context are as similar as possible and as similar as appropriate. In some jobs, it's okay for people to be trained in a conference room and then work in an office environment, but there are certain positions, for instance, law enforcement, they need to be trained in situations that mimic the real job as much as possible.
make sure that you provide enough space in the materials, the physical materials for people to be able to take notes, jot down ideas, questions that they might have, and make sure you give everyone a writing utensil. I cannot tell you the number of training programs I've attended and I have to bring my own writing utensil, which I never, I never do. Label important features of the content. Some information is going to be more important than others. Make sure you identify the areas that will be heavily tested. Make sure you identify areas that other people tend to struggle with. Pointing out some of this information can help people direct their attention to the things that they need to study and that they need to focus on. Provide opportunities for people to integrate all that they're learning and plan for how they're going to transfer that information back to the job. Make sure that you require people to practice the new behaviors that they're learning about. If you're teaching people how to conduct therapy, make sure that you give them an opportunity to role play uh, a therapy session with their fellow trainees. That practice is often where the real learning happens. Build people's confidence, their self-efficacy, so that they stick with it. Sometimes training and learning and growing is difficult. Sometimes we make mistakes and sometimes it's really hard to grasp a concept. We want our trainees to feel like if they just keep working, they can do this. After the training program has been conducted, there are a few things we wanna to do to make sure that people transfer their learning. Make sure they get more opportunities to practice on the job. Make sure that the climate is supportive, that the manager is supportive, that the manager's manager is supportive, that direct reports are supportive. And finally, we need to encourage continual learning. Training sessions occur often in isolation, but we want people to be constantly learning, practicing, getting feedback, and often self-directing this process. Results criteria and return on investment are the two most important factors that we should consider with any training program. Results criteria measure whether or not the training outcomes are connected to organizational goals. We can look at things like how much more productive are our employees? How much money did we save? How many errors did we reduce? Did our customer satisfaction scores increase? Return on investment helps us measure both the benefits and the costs of training. Utility analysis is the specific procedure we use to assess the economic contributions of a training program, whether or not the money that we spent actually helped us change behavior, change performance. Cost assessment involves one-time costs, things like how much did it cost us to conduct a needs assessment, how much did the designing of the program cost, how much did it cost us to design and print the materials. We would also look at the costs associated with each training session. How much does it cost to train the trainers and to pay them? How much does it cost to rent the space? And how much does it cost to keep the lights on? We can also look at the costs associated with each individual trainee. How much does it cost for them to take off work? How much does it cost the organization? How much does it cost the individual? Hopefully they're being paid for training, but that's not always the case. And we'd also look at travel and lodging costs. Benefits assessment helps us determine what we got out of the training program, both in terms of performance change, but also in terms of performance for the whole organization. For every 10 people who complete a training program, the organization saves on average $50,000 in terms of reduced errors. That might be an example of how we express the benefits in a way that can be used in a training evaluation process or through the utility analysis process. We wanna try to put a dollar amount on the performance change. How much is that performance change worth? In order to assess benefits, we want to make sure that we use a standardized process, that we use the same process for every single training program. And that process, the criteria, the information that is used to determine benefits will very much depend on the organization, its goals, its needs, what it's trying to accomplish. And of course, we want to 
avoid overstating the benefits of a training program. If it needs to be changed, it needs to be changed. Don't try to hide it by overstating what the organization is getting out of it. The overarching goal of training evaluation is twofold. One, to determine whether or not a change has occurred, a change in knowledge, a change in behavior, a change in performance. Two, can the change be attributed to the training program itself? There are a variety of other reasons why that person's performance may have improved. Maybe they've been reading a book, maybe they've been working with a coach. We need to make sure that it is our training program that is causing the behavior, the attitude, the performance change. There are several different designs that we can use to assess this to provide evidence of effectiveness. But regardless of the method that we choose, there are a few strategies that if possible, we should try to use. Establish performance expectations from the people who make decisions about the training program. What do they want to see? What do they expect? You don't want to walk into a meeting with these decision makers not knowing what it is they wanted. If possible, you want to randomly assign employees, trainees to different groups, and I'll cover that bullet point in a few slides will kind of explain when when would you randomly assign people to different groups there are situations where that is relevant if at all possible use a control group a group that allows you to compare the training group to a group that hasn't been trained when you compare these two groups it gives you a much better idea of whether the training was in fact the thing that increased performance and make sure that you obtain measures both before and after training. If you are assessing learning, and in many cases we are, a pretest is just as important as a post test. These first two evaluation designs allow us to assess whether a change has occurred, but it doesn't tell us whether the training is what contributed to that change. A one shot post test design is very simple. It's the most common, but it's the least useful. One shot, we give one test, and it's after the training program. So if you've ever been through a training program and at the very end you take an exam, they are using what is called a one-shot post-test design, a test at the end of training. But how do we know that a change occurred if we don't have something to compare post-training knowledge to? We need a pretest which brings us to the second training evaluation design, a one group pre-test, post-test design. Using one group, the training group, we compare their pre-training scores with their post-training scores. But the group goes through the training at the same time together. This particular design lets us know whether the difference between pre and post knowledge, it can tell us whether that difference is statistically significant, whether there is a, a significant difference in learning that occurred over that training program. We cannot assess that with a one-shot post-test design because we don't have anything to compare the post-test data to. The next three training evaluation designs can help us assess both of the goals, whether a change occurred and whether that change can be attributed to the training program itself. A post-test only control group design allows us to compare the training group's scores after training with the control group's scores without training. In this situation, we split the people who need to be trained into two different groups, the training group and the control group. The training group goes through the training, the control group doesn't. We compare the scores of those who were trained to those who weren't. If there's a difference, we can assume with some limitations that it was in fact the training that caused or contributed to that behavior change. Now it's really important that the training groups are equal and we make sure they're equal by randomly assigning employees to both groups. Two groups, one's a control group that doesn't receive the training, you compare their scores to the group that did receive training and always remember to train the control group eventually. 
these two designs are the preferred methods of training evaluation. They are more complex, they take more time, they take more planning, they just take more effort in general. The pretest, post test control group design is a fancier version of the last design. Here we're making two comparisons. We're comparing the training group to the control group before training, and then the training group is going through the training, and we're comparing their post-training scores to the control group's second set of scores. Any differences we find between their scores before training may mean that differences we find later have nothing to do with the training. The two groups were different to begin with. So it must have been something about the way that we designed our, our internal study and not necessarily the training program itself. So this fourth option is, like I said, a fancier version of the last design. We're adding an extra comparison in order to help us identify it is our training program. It's not some other training program. It's not some other shared experience within the organization. It was our training program. Ideally, what we're looking for is that at the pretest stage, the control group and the training group, they actually score the same. And then after the training program, the trainees score really high and the control group scores the same that they scored earlier. That difference, that drastic difference is going to help us justify the cost of our training program. The final type of design is, is the most complex, it's the best, it's the gold standard, but it's nearly impossible to, to conduct in, in most organizations in a realistic sense the multiple time series design. This allows us to make multiple comparisons of the two groups at several times and at several different time intervals, both before and after training. By testing two different groups and comparing those scores at multiple times throughout the year, we get a sense of how long lasting the effects of a training program are. If after six months, the training group scores go back down to the control group scores, we have some evidence that the training program really only lasted for about six months. After a while, people forgot or they quit using the new behaviors. That information can help us make decisions about how to change the program and how to change the organizational climate to be more supportive. Compared to selection and performance, there are fewer legal considerations we need to make when it comes to training, but I have three here that I want to cover before we move on to career development. We cannot eliminate job applicants from the selection process when they lack KSAOs that can be easily trained on the job. If we require employees to have knowledge of our products, of our services, it doesn't make sense not to hire people because they don't currently have that knowledge. Most people wouldn't. It's a bonus if an applicant does, but if an applicant doesn't have that very specific, unique technical information, we cannot kick them out of the process. We have to make sure that we train them on the job. We also have to make sure that protected classes have the same access to training opportunities. And we have to make sure that the completion rates, the passing rates for these training programs do not show evidence of adverse impact. Protected classes should be completing training at the same rate as non-protected classes. We should thoroughly document all the training decisions that we make, um, any changes to the process. We should document the information we collect, just like any other activity that we participate in, we must document, document, document. This information can come in handy if we ever do find ourselves in the courts.